Christ came. Well, good morning. Uh, we are starting a new series this week, and so I'm Pastor Mike Kalani, if you don't know, uh, and I'm excited about where we're going. Uh, we just ended up uh, a series not that long ago in Jeremiah, and then had some others, uh, Father's Day messages, things like that. But this is a new one, uh, and we'll be, if you just kind of give you a heads up, we're going to be going through the Gospels, uh, specifically looking at the stories and where Jesus interacts with people who are not a part of his like tribe, uh, not some of his uh, already uh, his disciples. Um, and it, it, there, it, the premise of this, and I hope that you feel this premise, is that when you encounter Jesus, your life changes. Um, it'll never be the same once you uh, encounter the risen Lord. And I'm not just talking about being a Christian um, or, you know, in name only, because uh, we definitely live in a world today where there are people who call themselves Christians who, who call themselves Christians for other reasons than they met and encountered Jesus. And I'm going to say there's a vast difference. Uh, my hope personally is that every one of you, if you, you either have already encountered Christ, maybe through prayer, through worship, through the reading of his word, where you hear his voice in your life, or that you'll soon be there, uh, and that we as a church can help you get there. But the difference is pretty clear in our world between those who have and those who haven't. Um, like I said, it changes you. Uh, we're in an interesting place where uh, it's, it, it sometimes feels like we are strangers in a strange land. Have you ever heard that phrase before? I mean, you should. It's a pretty popular phrase. I know several songs that have the title, Strangers in a Strange Land. There's books, there's poems. Um, but that is actually a biblical phrase. First time it was ever used was uh, for one of Moses' sons. Because Moses was a stranger in a strange land. He had a son, so he named him Gershom, which means stranger in a strange land. But what's interesting is that then became applied to almost all of God's people. As you see, like in later passages in Acts 7, 6, God spoke to this effect and he said, his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging, belonging to others and they would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. Basically saying God's people would be strangers in a strange land. And then Jesus eventually even says it to his disciples Straight up when he says in John 17, 16, you are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. And so you get this idea that there's this, this reality between the difference between those who, who you know, are, uh, have encountered Jesus become strangers in this world. All of a sudden, this is not all there is. There's something more. Um, there's, uh, you see things through a different lens, an eternal perspective. Uh, you see things as, you know, not everything needs to be accomplished right today. There's, there's time. And so as, if you have met that, and if you've been there, uh, and you've encountered Jesus, you can start to feel more and more like that stranger in a strange land. And it doesn't take much. All you have to do, and I'm sure you felt it, is turn on the TV, open a social media app, um, listen to music. Uh, you will find that there, just there, there are there are beliefs, thoughts, ideas that are so alien to someone who has met Christ. Uh, I'm not trying to judge. I'm just saying it's different. And you can look at somebody from a different faith background different cultural background, maybe different personal persuasions, you know, different values. And you can both be talking to each other. And what's interesting is both of you can sit there and say, I'm right, I'm true, speaking the truth. And you're like, well, well clearly it's not because I believe I'm right and I'm speaking the truth and we're saying opposite things. And so something's not right here. It's, uh, so I'm, I'm going to give you the vocabulary word of the day 
called incongruence. Okay, all right? So you can, if you do your vocabulary, no, I'm kidding. But it, it basically means it's it not aligned. Uh, it, it doesn't fit together. When you meet Jesus, all of a sudden this world doesn't necessarily fit anymore. It changes you. And sometimes you can feel like it's just a different line. As it, it's as if you, like, just imagine if you've ever done that, been in a country where you didn't speak the language and everyone else is going on, talk, 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 and everything's normal for them and you cannot understand what they're saying. You, know, you don't know where it's coming from. Uh, that doesn't seem like the best kind of advertisement for coming to know Jesus, but, but, but you'll see why, why this is... Uh, important. Um, Reality is, is that Christians who have encountered Jesus today uh, are living in a world where they don't necessarily understand the culture. Uh, I shouldn't say understand. Maybe they they don't, they don't align with the culture anymore. And it's, it's, it's as if sometimes there's different rules. Uh, I mean, just think about things, you know, what is, Moral, the people will have a very different set of what what that means than those who are followers of Christ, and because of that, we at the church tend to, I think not. I shouldn't say this to the church. Everybody who deals a little bit with that incongruence with another group tends to avoid that group. We were just talking about, like, you know, I mean, just imagine, uh, you know, I'm an Astro fan. Uh, I know you guys are Dodger fans. Um, and I know Dodger fans apparently really hate Astros fans, you know. Um, I have no idea why, just kidding. Um, I know exactly why. But, but, there, but there's that sense. Let's say you're at, like, a, you know, a pregame party for a Dodgers game, and you come in with Astros hat, and you're like, go Astros, you know, kind of thing the room would go awkward silent because people would be like, who invited you to our party? What are you doing here? You know, that, and I'm sure you've been in situations you know, where, where someone says something and it's like, oh, clearly you don't know where you are or who you're talking with. And everyone kind of very silently, you know, everything goes quiet because until you realize they have to say, oh, ooh. I said something wrong. That is, a, that is our tendency, is to sit there and say, you know, I don't want to hang out with a person who doesn't agree with me and how I see things. I want to hang out with people who do agree with me. And so we avoid people who are different than us. At least most people do. The strange thing is, is that that is kind of the opera, you know, the modus operandi of almost everybody until that person who's different from them is somebody they love. Somebody who is special to them. Someone they care about. And then you get to that point of like, how do I reach out? How do I communicate with that person? I say all of that because... This series is based on that premise of trying to answer that question. We can sit here and and kind of, and I think we arrogantly sometimes say that, man, the world has never been more alien to Christians than it is now. That's probably, every generation has said that. Oh, it can't get worse. Uh, People can't be more different than they are. And I'm just going to say, I get it. It feels that way at times. But truth be told, it was never more alien to be a Christian than it was for Jesus. Because guess what? There was no Christians until Jesus came and started teaching what he taught. And so this is, we have this great example of someone who is speaking to a world that does not understand in a way that helped them to see it. Jesus is a great example, and as we go through this series, we're going to encounter him uh, talking with person after person, opening their eyes, getting that aha moment, 
And I'm going to say each of those people, we're going to begin to say, oh, wow, that reminds me of someone or something. And we'll be able to bridge, hopefully bridge that gap ourselves. Because the reality is, is historians and um, sociologists, there's actually this neat little trend going on right now of people starting to really appreciate Christianity's impact on the world, uh, even though they're not Christians. Uh, it's, uh, there's just recently, there's some famous like militant atheists who say, well, we could bring a little Christianity back. I'm okay with a, a little Christianity because I don't like where things are going. And it's a, it's a nice kind of like, you know, net to keep things in place. Um, and you're beginning to see that where historians are sitting there going, wow, Christianity really was a good for our world. And we, we shouldn't be so hasty to get rid of it. And so, so we, we live in a world that kind of has been shaped by Christianity more so than we even can imagine. The problem is, is that the world today has basically said that, well, those values and everything that Christ gave you, well, Christ didn't give them. We made them up ourselves. And, uh, and we are now going to define what those mean. And so they've, they've kind of tried to keep the values without Christ. And so Jesus, though, is in a culture which did not have those values at all. I was, this blew my mind the other day. You know, we think of humility as a good thing, right? They used to not think that. All you have to do is go back and you look at ancient times and there was no humility. It was all about honor and pride. And, and that was how the culture lived. And it's only because of Christ that, you know, I could keep going but those values that we all hold were not something that everyone held at the time. And so, so as we look at these encounters, I hope that we really can gain uh, from them. So that's a big setup to do the very first encounter. Uh, if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Um, and I'm going to read uh, what, what Scripture records as Jesus' very first encounter with somebody that was not a part of like one of his disciples. Uh, it's, in, it's, a, it's a neat story. It's in Luke chapter 5, Matthew chapter 8, and Mark 4, 1. I'm picking Mark because I think it has the most detail. Uh, but let's go ahead and read it. I'll start in verse 38. And he said to them, those are the disciples, let us go to the next town that I may preach there, uh, for that is why I came out. And he went through Galilee preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling and said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see, that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and the, an offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. Um, but he went out and he began to talk freely about it and to spread the news. And so Jesus could no longer op openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. And the people were coming to him from every quarter. Now, this is a significant story, uh, but what's interesting to me is that it is Jesus' very first encounter, uh, and it's in all three Gospels, but oddly, as significant of an encounter as it is, we don't have any, like, children's stories about the leper. You know, you, know, you have children's stories about Zacchaeus and other people, but we don't get many children's stories of the leper. We don't have any cute little sing-songy songs uh, about, you know, Jesus and the leper. Um, and it, it just, you know, spitball in here a little bit. Maybe it's because leprosy is kind of gross. And maybe a little cute drawing of a leper isn't that cute. You know, and maybe kind of like a song about a leper isn't so funny, you know. Uh, I, I make that point up because we're dealing with something it's easy to read words but when you put images to words oh wow this is a this is a you know kind of a an uncomfortable situation 
See, my dad was a doctor, and he had these books. And in these books were like all the kind of diseases that you could get. And the book, and I was as a little boy, kind of that horror, can't put it down, have to read it book, was the skin disease book. You know, because most other diseases are written in description and kind of things. A skin disease book had pictures. Oh my goodness, that was awful. I'm not going to show you any pictures because I know lunch is still in your future. Um, but it was, I mean, the, the skin disease book was disgusting beyond all measure. Uh, but you couldn't look away. And I bring that up because it, it was, there's a nastiness to leprosy that I don't think we rem remember much because leprosy isn't really a disease we see in, around us much anymore. But just to kind of frame things a little bit for you, I've decided to try to pick some universally nasty things that will help you associate what, what you, someone might have felt about leprosy. Nothing, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not doing the grosser than gross thing, okay. Uh, uh, but but you, just to get it, you know, public bathroom floors. Would you if you dropped anything on a public bathroom floor, still like, you know, brush it off and, and maybe, you know, I don't know, take a, you know, if you, you dropped your Big Mac on the public bathroom floor, do you pick it up and, and keep eating? No. No, anything that touches a public bathroom floor is trash. You guys know, I mean, even your wallet. You know, if you drop your wallet on a public bathroom floor, what are you doing? You're buying a new wallet. Uh, you, you, well, you will, right? The, and I'm saying public bathroom floor because you know what I'm talking about. It, that, that, like, it is, it is the, you know, the game lava. Anything that touches it is done. Done, over. So just think about that. You know, nothing is coming up off a public bathroom floor and returning into my pocket or anything like that. Um, interestingly enough, this one's really odd. Like, uh, the human mouth. Anything comes out of the human mouth is deemed done, right? It's, you're never, you know, it's interesting. You're about to swallow it. I don't know, maybe you coughed, it came out. You don't put it back in. You know, it's done, right? If it comes out of the human mouth, it is now trash. Um, don't understand that as, you know, I, I do understand the feeling of it, but it is weird how just that little space distance and it's like, was edible, now it's trash. You know, it's, but human mouth, okay, all right, that's another one. You would never do anything but throw away something that came out of a human mouth. The other weird one is, uh, you know, you all get this, human hair. Human hair, when it's on someone's head, people brush it. They, they, you know, it's so beautiful. It's, you know, how wonderful. But the minute it comes off the head, somehow now it's become the pinnacle of disgustingness. You know, and even if there's just a little hair, let's say you have a big platter and there's a hair over here, the, it contaminates the whole platter. Um, I waited tables, I know, you know, and, and when, when the, yeah, and you didn't question, you didn't argue, it's just a hair, what's the big deal? No, you knew, disgusting. So I bring those up because that's like, you just, that's kind of, you have those things where you're like, nope. It's done. Not, not touching it. It's trash now. Now amplify that by like a thousand. And you have leprosy. Someone who had leprosy not only looked grotesque, but if you touched them, you could get it. You could be the next leper. Not only was it grotesque, but it was also potentially fatal, lethal. Leprosy, if you're going to sit there and say, what is the most disgusting, nasty thing in our world, most to be avoided in our world, it's hard to beat leprosy. It's, it's one of those things that, that throughout history, in every culture, people have avoided Old Testament, there's a whole section, Leviticus chapter 13, on what do you do with someone who has a skin disease that might be leprosy. 
kind of go through those whole procedures and you, you examine it and you, you clean it and you, you wait it out. And if after seven days it heals, you're like, whew. Luckily, it was just a rash or something like that. But after seven days, it's still there. You're a leper. And what that meant was that you had to put on, to match your future look of what leprosy was going to do to you, you had to put on the torn and ripped up clothes so that people could see, oh, wait, something isn't right here. Yeah. And then you had to go around walking, and if you encountered people, you had to say, unclean, unclean, as, as people walked by you so they wouldn't accidentally, not seeing you, brush up or touch you. You had to remove yourself from the, com- the community, live outside of the community by yourself for the rest of your days. Now, that sounds harsh, but you understand why, right? It was to protect the community from letting disease spread among the people. It was kind of like public health and guidelines. But it basically, as some famous historians said, have said, it was in effect a death sentence. You were a dead man walking. It was just a matter of time. The only thing you were going to do with the rest of your life was don't spread your disease. That was it. That's what it meant to be a leper. As noble as we may think, you know, oh, we would treat lepers better than we did. Uh, I think COVID showed us. Oh, no, we wouldn't. We would push them away. We would drive them out. And obviously, leprosy was far more lethal than COVID ever ever was but i remember you guys remember when early days of covid if you saw somebody else it was like you were in a zombie movie and you're like oh you know and and you you turn around and run the other way because you're not supposed to be anywhere near someone it was you know so we if we had if leprosy had thankfully cures have been developed but if they had not we would do what we used to do there used to be leper colonies where we'd say, oh, see ya. And now you go live in that group because you're never going to see society again. That is how nasty of a thing leprosy was. So what's interesting about this encounter with Jesus and the leper, and this is what I have, you know, this is one of the questions I'll ask God, is how did the leper know that Jesus could heal him? I don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, apparently, if you re- kept, keep reading the story, this is the first like physical ailment healing that Jesus did. And then and the leper told everybody, and then after that, you know, Jesus had flooded with people with those kind of ailments. But he's the first who comes to Jesus and says, if you will, you can clean me. Jesus had already been doing his ministry. My best guess is that Jesus had been giving hope and freedom from, from, you know, uh, other things to people. And lepers say, if he can give that person hope, Jesus, maybe you can give me hope. I've got this thing called leprosy. Would you please get rid of it? And truth be told is that Jesus could have, you know, Mark 140 said the leper came to him imploring him. And I use Mark because he actually said imploring him. Uh, I think that desperation just said, Jesus, I don't care. I see you're good. I see you do good for people. Could you do good for me? I think desperation just made him give it a shot. Uh, He he says, if you will, you can make me clean. And here's the interesting thing. Jesus could have, at that very point, gone to the leper and just kind of, he could have stepped back from the leper and said, sure, clean, you know, kind of bewitch kind of thing or whatever you know however you want him to do it he could have just granted that claim. we know that because there's other times when he would heal people from miles away and so we know there's not like some doesn't have to do it a certain way he could have just said sure stay away from me you're clean okay great you know don't touch me uh, but that's not what he does 
Mark 1.41 says, Move with pity. He stretched out his hand. That means he reaches towards him, touches him, and said, I will be clean. Jesus touches the untouchable. And this is where I wish you had the picture because it's, it's just like, you know when something's disgusting, you, the last thing you want to do is touch it. That's why you get like, you know, sticks and things and you like, you know, do the whole, like, can, I, can I pick it up without, you know, getting touching and then you put it in the garbage, that kind of, the last thing you want to do is touch it. And Jesus touches this man. Now here's the problem. And it's the problem everyone would have seen who witnessed this. And we know this. Unclean things make other things unclean. That's how just physics and chemistry and biology, all of that's how science works. Unclean things make other things unclean. If I were to take two glasses of water, you know, one would just pure, wonderful, refreshing water, and the other one I fill it with dirt. And I sit there and I pour the dirt into the clean water. Now both glasses are unclean, dirty, right? There's no way, there's no rationale, there's no science where the clean water makes the unclean water all of a sudden clean now. That's not how it works. We kind of see that. You guys, you know that. Like, when was the last time that the clean room in your house made the other rooms clean? <laughs> Does it ever? No, you know that. It's the, it's the cl- uncleanliness that spreads throughout the house. Those are realities that just are a part. We, we know them. And that, those aren't just physical realities. They're also social realities. We live in a world where we know that, that, that this is not just life. We're honest, we do this socially as well. People who think of themselves as clean have this attitude that they should not hang out with unclean people. Because their uncleanliness will spread to me. And that's how we operate. Like I said, we think of the physical reality and we apply it to the social reality as well. I could rattle off just groups of people that we sit there and say, oh, you should not associate with them. Because, and we don't say this, but because they are unclean. For one reason or another. And the, the idea is that if you hang out with them, you become unclean too. For most religious communities, most religions of the world, this is how they operate. Is that if someone makes themselves unclean, you shun them. You push them out. You avoid them. That, that is how many people operate. And then you have here Jesus who changes all of that when he encounters this person who's considered the peak of uncleanliness. And he not only heals him, but he touches him and says, you're clean. This is, this, you're, you, guys, you have to understand, you're witnessing the first time in history that something clean has made something unclean clean. Before Jesus, that never happened. If something unclean touched you before Jesus, you had to quarantine yourself for seven days to make sure that you weren't also now contaminated by whatever that was before you could re-enter into society. Priests would have to take off if they, if they had to go and visit their dying parents or they came in contact with a dead animal or something like that, anything like that. You had to separate. You had to say, well, I'm unclean now until I can go through the rites of making myself clean again. I'm, I'm tainted. And here you have Jesus, and I would say shockingly saying, I don't care. This guy needs hope. This guy needs 
to be healed and to be made clean, and Jesus does it. Mark 1.42, and immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. The president uh, of Wheaton College today said this, that ordinarily when something clean touches something unclean, it becomes unclean as well. But here, for the first time in history, things ran in the other direction as cleanliness of Jesus healed the unclean leper. Jesus turned this idea of being unclean on its head and he established a new reality that has shaped our world. I can't help but think of Mother Teresa a little bit. You know, if you guys know, the, you know she went to the leper colonies in India, okay? Um, because everyone was told, avoid those, don't go there. She served them and walked through them and, and, and nursed them while risking her own life and, and obviously... Uh, kind of going against social norms in order to serve and care for people. Now, she's not Jesus. You know, he healed. She served. But she had that heart to sit there and say, I don't care what they are. The question is, is where's my heart? You'll see this time and time and again, and it's just not with physical uncleanness. It's with the social. Jesus will engage people whose society would sit there and say, oh, you should not be talking to that person. That person is not someone it's okay to, to communicate with or to, to have a conversation with. What are you doing? Don't you know who that person is? And Jesus would time and time again say, yeah, I know exactly who I'm talking with and I know exactly why I am talking with them. Now here's where it gets a little uncomfortable. He, does, he expects his church, to do the same thing. We today are called the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet of, of Christ here on earth. And my question would be, would we engage people the way Christ engaged people? Or would we sit there and say, I'm not so sure I want to talk with that person. We still, and I would say, even in our churches, have an Old Testament mentality of, of the idea of the un, their uncleanliness may rub off on me, and I don't want that. Rather than having the Christ attitude of my cleanliness can spread to them, I can give them that. Now, I know some people will say, but Mike, what about those passages that talk about, you know, bad company corrupts good character and things like that? I get that. Um, those are true, but it isn't the people that, the bad people we think of that are the problem and passes as I, it isn't who you're hanging out with, it's why are you hanging out with them? I could totally get there and sit there and say, if, you know, if I'm going out and partying on the weekends, pretending I'm not who I am, pretending I'm somebody else or something like that, that's probably not something I should be doing. But if I'm in that same exact scenario because I'm talking to a friend who needs hope, who needs help, then I'm exactly where I need to be. It's not who you're with, it's why you're with them. Matthew 15, 18 and 19 says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and defiles a person for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, fault, witness, and slander. Hear that. Basically saying all those things you think are out there that will defile you if you come in contact with them are actually in here. And they might come out of you. And, the, and, and, and sometimes, let's, if people are honest, sometimes they want it to come out of them. And so that's why they're in certain situations. It's not what's outside of you that makes you clean or unclean. It's what's inside of you. When bad company corrupts good character, it's because I wanted it to corrupt my character. The problem isn't them. The problem is me. Yet if I'm there to bring healing and hope to those who are looking for it, there is no such thing as bad company. 
And I think we're going to see that Jesus shows us that time and time again. There's only opportunity for people to meet Christ. For the rest of Jesus' ministry, he would be criticized by those, for those who he associated with. And I'm going to ask, these are in conclusion, would you have been one of those people who criticized who Jesus hung out with? And we're going to see who those people are. Some very sordid, past, controversial, corrupt, whatever you name it, people. Would we criticize someone for building that bridge with that person? And here's the other question. Would we be willing to be criticized for who we are hanging out with and because we're trying to do what God wants us to do and speak to them about Christ. It is my prayer that as we go through the series, we would sit there and begin to shape our hearts to the point where we can sit there and say, Lord, use me. You know, help me. I, I, we don't want to be this kind of place that sits there and, and has who can or who can't, who's in, who's out. There's that sense of anybody's looking for hope and looking to be restored or made right or made clean. My prayer is they sit there and say, you are welcome here. And that we would reach out to them as well. Let's pray. Lord, Father, thank you so much for uh, how you just gave us this incredible example of what it means to love people enough to look past the things that might keep us away. Um, I just think about, Lord, just how I was probably that person at one point in my own life that people would have avoided. I'm thankful, Lord, that you drew near. I pray we would all have that sense in our own lives where we know, Lord, apart from you, uh, we are no better than anyone else. And so, Lord, make us uh, understand that the only cleanliness we have in our lives is because of you. And, Lord, you want us to share it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.